Well, I want to welcome you today. It is the fourth Tuesday in the season of Advent. I can't believe we're this close to Christmas, just a couple of days away. And so I'm excited, I hope you are too, because nothing's going to stop Christmas from coming, is it? I don't care, there's no pandemic, there's no struggle that we've got going on that's going to keep Christmas from coming. Even amidst the times that are difficult in life, God truly crashes into our universe and lets us know that we are loved and cared for. That's what the season of Advent, the season of Christmas is all about. Let's take a time and a moment just to pray. Heavenly Father, we do give you thanks again for your many blessings. We thank you for this day, this Tuesday, this fourth uh, Tuesday in the season of Advent. May you open up our hearts to your word today that we might be inspired and truly ready and prepared to meet the King once again. For it's in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so the King wants to come into our midst. And of course, that's what the entire purpose of this season of Advent is about, is to remind us that there's a King who wants to dwell with us. The King of the universe wants to come and dwell in our midst. And so here we are, 1 Samuel, what in the world is, or 2 Samuel, pardon me, 2 Samuel 7. We've been in Isaiah the entire time during the season of Advent, and now, of course, the lectionary folks have pulled a fast one on us. And actually, this one makes a lot of sense. So we're all the way back. I'm just going to tell you a little context here about this. We are now 400 years earlier than where we were at last week. Did you feel that time warp? We went back 400 years. We are now around 950 B.C. So last week we were around 500 or so B.C., 520, give or take. Okay, so here we are, 400 years before 500 B.C. What was going on 500 B.C.? Lots of stuff was going on. Oh, there was this guy named David. The second king of Israel. Oh, there was something else, just kind of cool, cool uh, little piece of information that you might be interested in knowing. The language of Hebrew was invented around 950 AD. It makes a lot of sense because, again, uh, the Jews were Canaanites, at least in their biological heritage. They spoke Semitic languages. There were many different Semitic languages. Hebrew grows out of many of the other Semitic languages, but it was invented around this time in service, probably by David or by his son Solomon. So it's a relatively, is one of the newer uh, innovations in the Semitic languages. There are many that were more ancient. But, um, so they created their own language called Hebrew around the exact same time. So all this stuff was going on. David, as you remember, when he finally becomes king, it was truly a battle. He had to fight many battles on either side from people rebelling in his own kingdom, sons who wanted him killed and wanted to take the power for themselves, and of course early on by the previous king, by Saul and by his soldiers, even his own friend Jonathan had to be on the side of the king, and that was just truly a tragic circumstance. You remember that, how Jonathan, David's best friend, was killed uh, along with Solomon, or Saul, pardon me. And so finally, after years and years and years of battle, David has finally come to a point where the kingdom has been created. Now what? <laughs> what are you going to do now? So David said, you know, it's like, think about it. An interview comes up to you and you just won the Super Bowl. So you just won the Super Bowl? Well, hey, David, you just won the kingdom of Israel. You just created this great thing. What are you going to do now? Well, you know, I guess Disney World wasn't an option or wasn't available to, him, available to him at that point. So his thought process is, hey, I know I'm going to build. Are you ready? Are you ready? I'm going to build a... What's he going to build? No, not Disney World. I'm going to build a temple. Ooh, now that I'm prosperous, now that I've built a big, beautiful house for me, now I'm secure, I'll build one for God to show how much we love God. <laughs> he kind of has it a little bit backwards, right? Um, if you truly love God, don't you start here? No, these folks ended here. 
It reminds me of the Slovaks when they first came and built this building in which we reside in. I have such admiration for the Slovak um, forebears of this uh, congregation here. They would go to work 12 hours a day, five days, six days a week at the mill here in Pittsburgh, East Pittsburgh. And it was dirty, filthy, hard work, and they didn't make much money. But they took a great portion of what they had, and they came and they built this building. Now, when I say they built this building, they built this building with their own hands. They would come home after 12-hour shifts, and they'd work another four hours on this building to make it available to us today. That was nearly 100 years ago they built this building. That's an amazing thing. Well, David, he waits until the battle is done. He doesn't come home after a 12-hour shift and, and build the temple or while he's fighting the battle and build the temple. He waits until the battle's won and he's prosperous and all's good. And then he says, hey, let me build the temple. So let me read to you this. So after the king was settled in his palace. Okay, listen to it. In his palace. God doesn't have any place to reside. What's the deal with that? The Lord had given him rest from all of his enemies around him. And, and uh, David said to Nathan, the prophet, do you remember who Nathan is? Nathan was one bad dude. I mean, not bad, bad. I mean, bad dude. He was, he was an amazingly tough, rugged individual. He was a prophet. He had the guts and the courage to confront David. When David had Uriah, one of his leading generals, killed so that David could get away with sleeping with Uriah's wife, Bathsheba. You know, how slimy is that? Uriah is out fighting battles to protect the king, and the king is out sleeping with the general's wife. Makes him a pretty slimy man, doesn't it? And then he has Uriah killed. Nathan is the guy who had the, front, uh, the, the courage to confront the king's power and tell him how wrong he was and how he needed to come to repentance. That takes guts, because he could have been off with his head. Most kings wouldn't have tolerated that. David at least listened. You give him credit there. He listened, and he repented. But this is that guy. This is Nathan. So this is one rugged, tough individual. All right, so he says to Nathan, here I am living in a house of cedar. Cedar was very expensive. It had to be imported, no cedar in Israel. So he said, while the Ark of God remains in the tent, the Ark of God, of course, the Ark of the Covenant. You know, any of you saw Indiana Jones and the, yeah, and the Ark of the Covenant? Very realistic. I'm kidding, by the way. Dr. Jones and the Ark of the Covenant. Um, yeah, so this Ark had made its travels for hundreds of years. Because again, if you think, if we imagine that Moses was maybe 1200 to 1500 BC. We're talking three, four hundred years later. This ark is still sitting here, kind of in a traveling sideshow. It doesn't have any place to remain. It represents the presence of God. So he wants to build a temple. So Nathan replied to the king, Whatever you have in mind, go ahead, do it. The Lord is with you. So no problems here. But that night the word of the Lord came to Nathan. Okay, here's what I want you to hear. I'm going to set you up for what I want to direct you to hear, and I could be wrong. But actually, I don't think I am. Here's the thing. The temple of God. God's purpose is always to reside with us, the common people. In Genesis 1, the seventh day of creation. Oh, see, everybody is so silly. They think the sixth day. Creation of humanity is the most important day in the day of creation. No, it's not. The seventh day is the most important because it's on that day that God rested in God's temple. Do you know what God's temple was? The earth amongst us humans and all of God's creation. How can you build a better temple than that, right? So there are people who say, well, you know, I don't need to go to church to worship God. I can go out into the wilderness, out, into the, out in, the, in the woods. You know, they're kind of right. Because God is present in the woods. God is present in the mountaintops. God is present at the depths of the sea. 
Because this is God's temple. Okay? And God's intention was always to ride, reside amongst us. And so what does a temple do? It removes God from the common person. We put all this ritual and all this tradition between us, the common people, and God when we create a temple. This is not the way of God. No, it's okay to have something that kind of represents God. I get it. We personify God in that manner. But God's purpose was always to reside with us. Now maybe you see why this lesson was put here at the end of our Advent presentation. Because what does God do with Jesus? God tabernacles or dwells with us in Jesus. A baby boy. A poor baby boy. A common baby boy. That to all intents and purposes, you look at him, you just say... What's so special about him? Oh, it's just God with us. Because God comes to us in the most amazing of ways. So God doesn't want a temple to reside in. God wants to be with the common people. So listen to what happens. What are your, um, but that night, the word of the Lord came to Nathan, the prophet, and said, go, tell my servant David, this is what the Lord says. Are you the one who's going to build me a house to dwell in? i got something better. I have not dwelt in the house from the day that I brought that I, I brought the Israelites out of Egypt. And you're going to build a house for me? Really? I've been moving from place to place with a tent as my dwelling. Wherever I've moved with the, all, the, all of the Israelites, that's important. Wherever I have moved with all of the Israelites, did I ever say to any one of their rulers whom I commanded to shepherd my people, Why have you not built me a house of cedar? God doesn't care about buildings made with human hands. God doesn't care about the trappings of wealth. So, you know, people would build these great big cathedrals, and that was kind of our way of honoring God. God doesn't care about that stuff. Oh, referencing Indiana Jones again. It was I think it was the last one, a really crummy movie. Uh, the one with the aliens, I think it was. But, um, the, you know, I think Indiana Jones had to pick the cup from which Jesus would have drank. And of course, the one person says, oh, I know which one it is. He grabs it's the, the most ornate one. No, it ends up being the simplest of cups because that's the way God is. Who does God associate with? Not the rich and the powerful, but the poor. God doesn't want a temple made with, with this ostentatious beauty. I mean, it's lovely. It's great. I get it. But God is one of the common people. God dwells and identifies with us. I don't need a house built with cedar. You know, uh, back, in the, um, back in the day, <laughs> I mentioned to you how the Jews were Canaanites. They came out of that lineage. That was their, their heritage. It's not just their heritage. They're biologically related to the Canaanites. And um, the Canaanites worship Baal. The Jews worship Baal for quite a while. Uh, we see this historically, it's evidence, it's in the Bible, but it's not only that, we see that historically in, um, uh, in, in the, the digs that we do around Jerusalem and so forth. Baal worship just permeated even Israel at the time that David became king. They, they, they celebrated and worship El and Asherah and Baal and so forth. But uh, Baal... Uh, Baal, of course, El was their primary god, Asherah, his wife. It depends on which tradition or myth you're using. But, so, let me write this down just so you can see this. Because I really geek out about this stuff. And I have a lot of fun with it, and I hope you like it too. But El and Asherah, in one uh, of the traditions, where were husband and wife... And they had a son, many children actually, but they had one son called Baal. And so Baal was one of their progeny. And Baal uh, saved all of the other gods' rear ends, okay? He saved them. And so Baal's sister came up to El and said to Baal, he's, he said, she said, you know, El, 
you know, your son Baal just saved our bacon, okay? And here you are, here he is, um, he has no place to reside, to call his own. And so, will you make a house for him that's appropriate for him to live in? So, a house of cedar was made for Baal, okay? But, it catches on fire, it burns, and over a seven-day period, ding, 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 that number should ring in your brain, okay? After a seven-day period, on the seventh day, that, that uh, fire purified that building and those bricks and made it a house worthy of Baal, a house of gold. I am sitting here and telling you, these stories in the Bible are reflecting against this and saying, this is that God. This God wants a house of, of gold to live in, but not the God of the Jews. Because the God of the Jews is a God of the common people and wants to reside amongst them. Okay? This is not our God. Our God doesn't want a house built with gold. Our, our God wants to be with us. So you tell my servant, Nathan is told by God, this is what the Lord said. I took you from the pasture, from tending the flock. I appointed you ruler over my people. I have been with you wherever you've gone. You didn't need to make a temple for me. Do you get this? This is what he's saying. You don't need to make a temple for me to be with you. I just want to be with you. I've cut your enemies off before you. So I will make your name great like the names of the greatest on the earth. I will provide a place for my people. God is the one that's going to build the building. Not you. And wherever you are, there is God. I will make your great name great. I will provide for you. Wicked people will not oppress you anymore. I will also give you the rest from your enemies. The Lord declares to you that the Lord himself will establish a house for you. And so when your days are gone and you rest with your ancestors, huh, isn't that a beautiful image? I will raise up your offspring to succeed you, your own flesh and blood, and I will establish your kingdom. So he is the one who will build a house for my name. Okay, what goes on to, to Solomon? But I do want to stop there. What God, again, is trying to say is that he doesn't need a place built with cedars or gold, a palace built with human hands. God has always chosen to dwell amongst us. Now do you see why, again, this lesson is chosen for the fourth Tuesday of Advent for us to remind us that once again, God does not come to reside amongst us in a temple made with human hands or a palace of gold. Anything that's ostentatious is not something that's of God. It might make us feel better and might bring awe into our hearts, but the God of the universe stoops down into the squalor of history, into this tiny little insignificant town of Bethlehem. And decides in that place and time to dwell in our midst as a poor little baby boy. I want you to understand that this God is for you. This God has come this way for a purpose. Because you all think, and we all think, because religious leaders have tried to convince us that God, we are not worthy of God. We can't be around God. We surround God with rules and regulations and, and all this beauty and ostent, uh, this, these things of ostentatious nature. And, and this is not God. God likes the common, ordinary people. God wants to dwell in your midst. So you know when you're sipping your beer and watching your game, guess where Jesus would be? Right there. Sitting and watching the game with you. And drinking a beer with you. Because that's the type of God we have. God isn't in a temple made with human hands. God doesn't care about these things. God wants a relationship with you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I am so grateful for this lesson. 
which we receive with gladness and joy today. We are on the cusp of something spectacular. We are again living in a difficult time. It is a very frustrating day and age. Nothing is kind of new in the world, but what is new is that the God of the universe chooses not to be birthed amongst the rich and the powerful, to be housed in temples away from the hands of those who just do not have the sophistication as the educated. The God of the universe chooses to dwell amongst the poor, the common people, because that's the God of the universe, the one who wants to dwell amongst us. So we give thanks for this in Jesus' name. Amen. May God's blessing be upon you and give you peace and joy this Christmas season, now and always. Amen. Hey, have a wonderful Christmas. Join me, 6 o'clock, Christmas Eve, to 6.30 on Facebook. There will be a time where you get to actually interact with me live for half an hour. I'm going to be online. I'm going to to show you all the decorations of the church. We can't have in-person worship this year. I'm going to show you the church. It's going to be decorated. It's going to be beautiful. We're going to also then sing a song, and you're going to hear the, the, the gospel lesson for that day. And then I'm going to send you off to watch the full worship service that will be ready for you Christmas Eve at 6.30 p.m. If you can't get there in time for 6.30 p.m., maybe you're busy or visiting somebody's home. The great news is, like all of these premieres, it's just a premiere on, on YouTube channel. It will be available anytime you want to watch it after the premiere is concluded. So I hope you'll worship with us Christmas Eve and also on Christmas Day, 9 a.m. There'll be a premiere of a Christmas Day worship. It's only going to be a 35, 40 minute service. It's going to be almost all Christmas music. And we're just going to have a great time singing these great songs of Christmas. So blessings to you. Have a wonderful Christmas and holiday season. And be safe and be respectful. Amen.